actually have heard that popular line, that famous quote, that statement that probably didn't come across quite as accurate as it maybe should have, but Houston, we have a problem. <laughs> in other words, when satellite, you know, when people in space decided that they had a problem and called Houston, it was a problem. And sometimes in life, we find ourselves dealing with problems and issues that we don't know the solution. We don't know what to do, we don't know where to go, and we really don't know how to deal with it because though we may have prayed about it, though we may have possibly talked to God about it, it's almost as though God were taking a stick and beating us with it because we seem to be doing it over and over again. We seem to be facing the same issue. We seem to be dealing with the same problem. We seem to be having the same conflict that's going on inside ourselves as well as sometimes with other people. Somehow, we've looked back over our life and we've seen, hey, I've noticed there's a pattern here. I've noticed there's a reciprocal action that's going on over and over and over and over again, and I'm the one doing it. Now, I understand that maybe there is this idea of you know, continuation of sin and that God will eventually eliminate it from us, but there's more to life than repetitiously sinning and saying grace abounds, how much more so since sin abounds, how much more so grace abounds for us, and that if our heart condemns us, greater is he that is in us than he that is you know, in the world that's condemning us. Well, if you want to stop doing what you're doing, you got to know why you're doing it. you got to know how you're doing it. you kind of got to get a little bit more than just kind of putting a band-aid over a bleeding wound when the reality is you're the problem and not God. So how do we deal with that? How do we act accordingly when our relationship with God is in such a disarray that we can't really get clear observation of what we're doing and we don't understand why we keep doing the same things we're doing? Is it only our sinful nature that has caused us to fall into some great temptation? Is it only our sinful nature that has made us to go through one marriage and then another and then another? Is it only the fact that society as a whole has forced us into some issue where we hate our jobs or we hate our life, where we don't like our feelings, where we find ourselves in despair and we cannot come to grips with the reality of what's going on in our soul when we should have been a joyful Christian and we're not? Do we understand why we can feel discontent in the midst of everyone who feels contented and happy and singing praises? And we feel that for a moment, but when we go home to our life, we're dissatisfied with where we're at. That's conflict. That's real, genuine conflict. That's something that you and I go through every day. Oh, maybe not in the same degree, Maybe some of us go through greater conflict than others. Maybe the biggest conflict you have is which clothes to wear, which style you're going to put on. Or at least, on the surface, that's what it looks like your only conflict is. Because while it may look like you only have the choices of what to wear, why are you having to make a choice when God doesn't care what it is you wear? You see, there's more to the observance of what's on the outside than what we really understand of what goes on the inside. And since God is the one who can look on the inside, sometimes we need to find out from Him what it is that He's teaching us about our inner conflict that's going on by way of the outer conflict we have with whatever it is we're going through at the time. So we need to deal with those issues as God sees them, not as we see them. So Father, I ask that in Jesus' name you would help us today to find our way in this life that you've given us, in these principles that you've taught us, in the observation of those things that are outside of us, that you would somehow, O oh God, meet us in our need 
that you would teach us to find that inner quality of life that you said we could have peace that we could know love that we could experience joy because God without peace in our life without love in our heart and without joy on our lips there is no expression of the faith that we claim to have when we call ourselves Christian so in principles of life today God help us to find the way that you would choose for us to understand what it is you have to say for us for without your spirit we can do nothing without your word we are poppers and beggars asking you to reveal to us what it is we need to think about what it is we need to consider and what it is we need to do for ourselves amen in principles of life we've decided and determined that using the Institute of Basic Youth Conflicts we would discuss we would cooperate as it were together in a learning experience which isn't about someone teaching and it isn't about someone preaching, but it's about you and I going through a cooperative experience whereby I have the opportunity to apply the same things that are going on here as you can there in your life. Because you see, I have conflict. I am always in conflict of one type or another, in some way in consternation as an antithesis of what the scriptures say we should have, which is peace. Now, do I have perfect peace? Sometimes. Do I have perfect love? Sometimes. Do I have joy? Sometimes. But I also have the means with which I know what the issues are, and I can deal with them with God cooperatively, agreeing with Him to work on them together as He changes me from one glory into another glory, from image to another image into what he wants me to be as I agree with him and as I go forward in cooperation to the things that he's teaching me and applying in my life. And as he does that, he uses the Bible in a way of being the instruction book of life. That He has said from cover to cover, it is the volume of the book that is written of Jesus and Jesus is my image that I'm becoming likened unto. So in order to become like him, I must know where he came from, where he's going, and how he becomes. And as I do, I find myself in conflict with the image of who he is and the person that I am. And so the Institute of Basic Youth Conflicts has books on research and principles of life, but conflicts of issues that we need to deal with, that things we need to consider to ponder and then to apply to our lives. So in Principles of Life we're learning how to take uh, take stock of as it were to question ourselves, our motivations, our intentions, our actions, our directions and the choices we make and why we make them. What's going on inside here that made me do something up here that made me come with something out here that made me do something right here. And that's conflict. When you run into another person dealing with the same issues you are, and you can't cooperatively work together with them, but you come into conflict with them. This is the ultimate goal, to be in communication, cooperation, and coordination with the will of God. This is the normal realization of what man and God does. They come into conflict with each other, and someone is beating their head against a wall because it's the love of God that will stop you from doing the things you're doing. Now as we studied last time in dealing with what were we dealing with? <laughs> as I opened the book, you know, tracing there we go. As we were dealing with tracing problems to root causes, we dealt with some of the examples of what root causes were as opposed to what the problem is. You see, sometimes there are problems that are on the surface, you know, kind of like scar tissue. You know, it's up here, but what caused the scar tissue? Either cancer that I had surgery on, or in my case, right here, I have a big old long scar about this long. You know, maybe, well, okay, maybe about this long going down deeper. Not too deep. <laughs> Woo -hoo! Close call. But it's about this long, and that's the surface issue. I have scar, a scar right there. But what caused the scar? That's the root cause. 
Well, because I needed surgery, I had to be opened up, and I had to have my intestines taken out and cut up and taken and removed. So the surface issue is the scar, or the surface symptom is the scar, but the issue was the surgery, and the problem was the disease. So you see there's more to the surface than meets the eye. It's just an indicator of what's going on inside that's more important. But what we want to do is we want to look at today dealing with surface problems. What are they? What's on the surface that isn't obvious? What's on the surface that we can put a handle on and take a look at and say, well, yeah, maybe I do have an issue. For me, I could break it down into, well, I don't know, maybe seven. I always say seven because seven is a number complete, maybe eight. But at least seven different areas that I would say are like concentric circles whereby we interact and act and have uh, interpolation of these circles that are concentric that overlap on each other in seven different areas of our life. And I, I like to teach that, but I can't teach it on a video. You know, it's not. Well, maybe I could if we really get in depth, but <laughs> as anybody knows about principles of life, getting too in depth is too in depth. You know, but anyways, maybe someday we'll get into all seven. But for now, we're going to deal, and I've I've abbreviated those seven different areas into a few smaller ones. I need to move this plant because the wind's blowing. <laughs> Oops, yeah, just beat that plant, okay? Oops, I beat the plant. <laughs> um, needed to move the plant out of the wind because we're sitting out on the porch, you know, and this is my porch, as it were. Ah, boy, that does smell good. Hmm. And knowing that the wind's blowing is the surface issue, what I needed to do about it was the plant problem and how I solved it was by moving it. So there's always a solution. The question is, do we deal with the issue or do we deal with the root cause? And so we want to talk about what the root or what the surface problems are that we deal with every day in life. And a lot of people take it from the scriptures that simply portray them as lust of the eye, lust of the flesh, and pride of life. Ah, that sounds good. I have no problem with that. Matter of fact, I'd probably tell you, stick with it. That's probably one of the best definitions you're ever going to get. The only problem is, what's that mean? And when you break those down, there's probably a whole lot more to lust of the eye than meets the eye. There is probably a whole lot more to lust of the flesh than really appeals to the flesh. There is a whole lot more to uh, pride of life than uh, really any of us are too proud to admit. <laughs> right? You got it. We need to get to the nitty gritty. And so, what I've come up with in nailing down those seven into three, whoops, and knocking over my Pepsi so that it's just one foam city, is that we have a problem. Now, how do we know we got a problem? Because it's on the surface. The surface problems are those things that are obviously going on in our life. They reveal themselves by the actions the attitudes and the things we do. The things we do with our hands, the things we do sometimes with our body, meaning our eyes, our looks, our emotions, the way that we portray ourselves, the way that we handle ourselves. So I like to break it down. Problem on the surface is usually dealt in the area of sensuality, soulfulness, and spirituality. Is that you probably have a problem in sensuality. Because, you see, the sensual problems are those areas of your mind that cause you to think in a certain way. You think by way of what you see, and you make that definite connection without really having the time to consider, ponder, pray, and to make a decision based upon a cooperation of different inputs, meaning intelligence, intellect, information, cooperation with the Spirit of God, coordination with God's will, and the experience of knowing the Word of God with wisdom. And so, knowing that there are six of those areas that I just mentioned, and there's actually seven, 
I couldn't think of the seventh one fast enough. But knowing that there's those things, that means that your sensual input may be off because it's reactive, your mind, as opposed to active in consideration. And that's where a lot of people's surface issue in sensuality deals with. They want immediate gratification. Sensuality wants what it wants when it wants it. That's a sensual response because it uses, as it were, whoops, <laughs> there we go, hey, we got it. It uses, in sensuality, the senses. It operates according to what you see, what you touch, what you feel, and what you handle with your own hands. It is a very tricky area of involvement when it comes to surface problems. Because you see, when your sense of touch is good, it's good to be able to say, hey, that's wet. I need to dry it off. It's good to say, ooh, it's cold. I need to put on some clothes and zip it up. It's good to say, ouch, that's hot, don't touch. Those are senses. The sense of touch is a very important one. Now, that sense of touch is used in order to bring input into your mind. It's meant to tell you something by way of sensory perception. The sense of touch is a very important sense. And that's just one of the, I believe there are five senses, but I think there might be more. I don't want to go into sense of smell too much or some of the other ones, but we'll just stick with the sense of touch and play it along as we go. So the sense of touch is important when it's used correctly. Now the sense of touch that's used incorrectly often is something that can cause you problems. For instance, like if I, ooh, touch myself, You've heard the songs. This isn't like childishness that I have to go, oh, God forbid that I touch myself somewhere that I shouldn't be touching. Because you know that that sense of touch will provoke a response. It can provoke a sexual response. It can provoke a sensual response. You know as well as I do that that touch can create a response. Now, the person who obviously goes to a doctor and has, let's say, their private parts, <laughs> That means their scrotum or whatever you want to call it. Even in a woman's situation when she's going to a gynecologist to have her vaginal area explored, she doesn't have that sense of touch reacting in a negative, perverted way. It's done in a medical profession. So you see how the sense of touch is still good. And yet, that sense of touch in the same way if it's used in a different context could be sin. So touch, when it's a problem, can be one of the senses that we get into problems when it's sensuality as opposed to information input. You see, the sense of touch always has been in order for you to touch something and to take information from that. And that's it. You should be able to discern good from evil when it comes to touch. You know what's a good touch and what's a bad touch. Your children sometimes are taught when it comes to child molestation, where they can be touched and where they cannot be touched. There's the idea of church hugs where they, you know, just kind of like, oh, well, you don't want to hug too close. Where I want to hug them like this. You know, I'll pick up anybody and hug you like this because I give you a bear hug. I'm huggable. But sometimes people do that because they have a problem in the area of sensuality because of the sense of touch. See how that stepped down? Do you get it now? Do you begin to get it? A little bit of handle here. Try to grab a hold of it for a minute, you know, because that's what we're dealing with, is problem, not the proper way. The problem is sensuality in the area of touch, of the senses, that, that sense of touch that's being perverted in sensuality to cause and create a problem. So, 
your sensual touch is not necessarily a good thing. Even when you try to use it in some perverted way, when they say that the marriage bed is undefiled and that, you know, all things are lawful to me, all things are not expedient. No. You can abuse the sense of touch and confuse it with the reality of what God has said. The sense of touch is not for you to go ahead and use it any way that you've chosen to. God has an order and a design for things, and that's why he's called us to holiness. Your sexual life should be as holy as your religious life. Your sexual choices should be as holy as God is holy because he is there in that person that you are having copulation with and cooperation in creating life with. So sexuality in the sensuality realm is failing the calling of God to have you be holy as he is holy. And you know why? Because we have perverted sex into sensuality. We've created something that should not have ever been a reality in our society, much less in Christianity today. And so the problem comes from the senses, again, in that response of, I want what I want when I want it. And sensuality always wants to have its needs met now. It's a media response to an input device that has created your intellect or your mind to immediately react in a negative way. And that's the problem. It's always been a problem. So what do you do about it in the sense of touch? Touch not. Quite frankly. The Bible says, touch not the evil thing. Touch not the woman that you see on the street corner. It says, touch not. See not, touch not, taste not. Quite simple. Now, I'd like to say it's that simple, but you see, there's more to it. This touch, remember, is only a surface problem. There is something more in the area of senses, sensuality, and the problem of touch than what meets the eye. And that's because we're only dealing on the surface issue. So let's take a moment, even in this area of touch that we talked about, to get to the book. You know, the book that we base all of this on, that we've been talking about, that we are using for principles of life. What have we done to touch, to cause it to be such a surface issue that we don't really understand what's going on? These problems are visible to other people. Okay? Point number one. Is your sense of touch visible to other people and the problem you're having with it? When you see people uncomfortable with touching each other, you can pretty much tell that they're uncomfortable. That means that there's a problem there. What the problem is, we may not know, but we see that a woman who's been raped doesn't want to be touched. That's obvious. So there's a problem. What's the surface issue? The surface problem is in the area of the senses, in the sensuality, based upon an experience that she's had in that area that has become a problem because of her experience. So the surface issue isn't whether she's to be touched or not. The surface issue, or the, the root issue, the surface issue is she doesn't want to be touched. The surface problem is to not touch her. The resolution of that we have to find is what's the root cause. And we'll find that later as we get into it. But that's the point. We're dealing with how to identify surface problems. The woman doesn't want to be touched. A child reaches out to touch her, and she doesn't like it. Ooh, what's going on there? A mother reaches down to reach out to her child when the child is you know, getting ready to fall, and the child balks at it. Why? A priest or a pastor or a teacher reaches out to a student, and the student shrinks from that touch. A trying to think of more examples of what the sense of touch and how someone reaching out um, is a negative way. A person, a black man, reaches out to a white person and that person shrinks away. Or the Jewish person reaches out to a Arabic person and the Arabic person pulls away. You see, the sense of touch reveals a lot about where a person is coming from because they react to it 
without thinking, unfortunately. They immediately respond without thinking through what they're doing. Their actions reveal that the surface problem is visible and we can see it. Sometimes it is clear what the deeper problems are. As in the case of the rape, obviously something had occurred and you can pretty much tell pretty fast how and what that problem is and there may be more in depth to that issue that's going on than what we realize. And sometimes the visible manifestation is very deceiving. When a person makes quick judgments, they often snap decisions that aren't positive because they think they know what's happening because they're dealing with the surface. I myself did not like to be touched. Really, seriously. I myself didn't have a problem growing up, really. My mother did. My mother didn't like to hug very much. She didn't hug me that often, you know, and it was pretty rare that her and I hugged. And when I got into church, I had no problem hugging people. I enjoyed it. But for a portion of my life, I did not like to be touched. As a matter of fact, it was very uncomfortable. If you held my hand, it felt ick. Ew. You know, almost like cooties or something. You know, I just kind of, my skin would crawl. I just felt uncomfortable. My nerves would jangle. When you got too close to me, I was very kind of like, not pulled back, but very aware of you standing in my space, which my space extended pretty far out. <laughs> but I was very aware of it, you know, and I was very conscious of every part of that flesh that was next to my flesh. But why? You see, on the surface, you might think, oh, well, the guy was abused. Oh, well, the guy was, you know, not loved as a child. It came from his childhood. And as it turned out, no, it had nothing to do with either of those. You see, to judge it on the surface, it would look like that. But the reality was that all my nerves were so tenderized from Crohn's disease that any little thing, including my clothes, felt very much confining and they just seemed to like scratchy on all parts of my skin. I was hypersensitized to every aspect of my body because the nerves were so out of whack that the body system inside was so maligned or misaligned that anything caused reactions that were not the normal actions of the sense of touch. It was just that because of that disease and because of that uncomfortableness and that that sickness that I had inside, I didn't want to be touched. So that led to <laughs> a host of problems until I could define why I didn't want to be touched. And if I defined why, I could work on how to make that applicable to other people so that they would understand why it was that at times I was touchable, so to speak, and at other times I was very much untouchable. <laughs> And so that's how you can mistake sometimes what somebody that doesn't want to be touched, that doesn't want you to handle them, that even sometimes you'll find that police officers have to deal with this situation because when they put their hands on someone to arrest them or to secure them in some way, they get a reaction from people that may not always be the best thing for that person that's being arrested or being confined in some way. And you see that in the hospitals, you see that in security, you see that in police officers enforcing the law, you see that in a variety of ways and variety of means. Even to this day when we look at going through airports and their security checkpoints, they don't take into consideration handicapped people sometimes that do feel you know, uncomfortable or do have issues that cause them to act in a certain way. So it's very important to be careful about what you see when you're dealing with sensual surface problems. Because again, it's a surface problem. It's not the real problem. Careful on touch. Always be careful. Because someone has said that, I'm sure this happens in your life, 
to a spouse. You're touching. Haven't you ever said that? Hasn't anyone ever said to you, you're touching? Meaning, you're grumpy or you're irritable. But why? Now, you could be touchy, but it's a surface problem, isn't it? You see, they know by the surface problem you're touchy. They don't know why you're touchy. They don't know how you're touchy. They don't know the issues that are involved in your touchiness. Maybe you're justified. Maybe your purpose is actual for a reason to have to be touchy. Maybe you're not moody. Maybe you're touchy for a particular reason that no one else can see, but God can see. And that's the part that we have to deal with always in surface issues when it comes to senses and sensual perceptions, when it comes to the reality of being touched and being touchy. Because it's an immediate reaction. And so there's an immediate consequence to that action. The reaction of being touchy when someone tries to touch you is push back, push away, you know, discomfort. And there is more to it because there's a spiritual side and an emotional response to it that we haven't even talked about yet on the whole idea of being touchy and being touched because it does involve our emotions and it involves our attitude and our spirit. And those things make for multiple ways of our problem to be amplified and magnified because when you get into the soul you will amplify your feelings because of the sensual or the sensory perception that's come in your feelings will get involved once your feelings are involved and that's where the whole idea of the soul is is that everything that's in your soul is your feelings not peace love and joy because those are spiritual fruits but feelings Once you get your feelings involved with this, once something has hit you in the senses, triggered your sensual response, become a problem, then it comes back down to your soul and you have a feeling reaction. Your feelings become involved and they amplify the response in the senses. They make it worse than it is. They act as a magnifying glass to make whatever action happen here in the senses become twice as much in your sensuality, in your thought process, so that you overreact in your soul by your emotions. Because by the time it's come down to here, this is an immediate, almost triggered response that goes directly to your soul and your emotions automatically become involved. They automatically puff up and make bigger whatever happened on the surface problem, they make it larger than life in the soulful emotional part. Because whenever emotions are involved in any part of your psyche or soma or persona that you are, when your emotions get involved, they react and act to build it up, to cause to feel and express themselves in some type of triggered response that you have inside of your flesh. Your body has and your soul has immediate response triggers that work together cooperatively. Just like the senses, when you push against this finger here, it will bend because the muscle pulls down. So likewise, at the same time, the senses, because there's a nerve that runs all the way up into my head tells me my finger is bending. So it connects with my mind and it tells me by intellect that my finger is bending. Because I can feel the finger bend. Because it has touched that sense and that sensory that goes through the sensory perceptors into the nerve endings that come all the way up into the brain and tell me that that's what triggered a response. The same thing is true in your emotions. There are triggered responses that based upon your experiences in your sensuality, in your mind, in your intellect, in the sensual responses of those inputs from your senses that causes you to react 
in some type of emotion. Whenever you are touched, when you are touchy, guess what? <laughs> you're grumpy. <laughs> no, you're irritated. <laughs> and that's because it's an irrational response. Sometimes that's why we have to ask God to help us to see like He can see because we're looking again on the surface issues. We're still dealing with surface problems and even though there are feelings involved, it's still superficial surface feelings. They're not the deep soulful feelings that are going to go on every day. Those are things that are long-term emotional responses that have been programmed into the soul that act according to thought, <laughs> the thought process, the experience, the application of memory triggered responses, the connections. I mean, there's, there, it really is, when you start getting into this pyramid of thought, you know, which I learned a long time ago back at Calvary Costa Mesa, it really is a huge domino effect once you start getting into how things work in your mind, your soul, your body, your spirit. And how it all cooperates together and kind of you know acts, and you go, huh? That's amazing. I wish I still had all the material. But the point is, is that there's a domino effect that happens with your feelings when they're triggered through your input device, meaning your senses of touch. And when you get angry, if you let that anger continue on and you think about it and you dwell on it, then you make it what's called a a um, not just an aggravated response that's immediate on the surface issue that becomes a surface problem, but you make it exist longer than one day. If it goes 24 hours, then it's become a sin. It's become a transgression. And transgression progresses into sin through a process also, but it becomes a transgression that will need to be addressed if it's not taken care of. It becomes more than a surface problem. It becomes an issue. And you have to deal with it accordingly step by step, kind of like unraveling it or peeling it back like an onion is peeled back in order to get to the center. Or like you would take the skin of an orange in order to get to the inside to eat the pulp. So too, issues like this, when you're dealing with surface problems, always have a very complex nature to them. And when you're dealing with feelings, they can be boiled down to real simple but they are connected in every area of your life, whether it be on the surface, whether it be internal, or whether it be spiritual. Those three areas will continually always have feelings involved in them, one way or another. As long as you are a human being, you will have feelings. You're always going to be a human being. You'll be godlike, but you'll still have feelings. Besides feelings, in that aspect of where we deal with the surface, we come to another area that we find ourselves automatically connecting to because our feelings trigger a response spiritually. And the spiritual responses are always interesting because there's a lot of them. <laughs> It's easier to say something like, the spiritual response is sin, but that's not true. Because sin, what sin does, it separates you from God. So really, what the actual response in the spiritual realm is, when you have your senses involved, your feelings involved, is your spiritual problem is... relationships. Every relationship you have, whether relationship to God, relationship to job, relationship to your own soul and spirit and intellect and intelligence and emotions, whether you have a relationship with your dog, whether you have a relationship with your cat, your wife, everything is infected and affected when you have a surface problem. Surface problems are obvious to us. Surface problems involve sensual or the senses response. That means that there's some kind of input that's happened, whether through the touch, sight, hearing, smelling, 
in some way something has invaded your senses and caused a sensual response to a surface problem that you're dealing with in the senses that immediately triggers a response in your feelings which is the soulful response and then because your feelings are attached to your spirit and affect and war against the flesh oftentimes the flesh is over here we'll kind of deal with that later in some later topic but right now let's just call the spiritual problems that we deal with relationships and that your relationships to every other person and every other thing as well as your thought process as well as your emotional response will be affected by your relationships because you've already triggered this to war against your personal relationship not just with God but with yourself even because even David cried out O oh my soul why art thou disquieted within fear not for I shall yet praise him David recognized his own emotions sometimes were triggered responses that were not in cooperation with where his spirit and his mind told him to be he knew that he would praise God but at the time that he was feeling it he was telling his soul I will overcome this I will yet praise him and that's part of what the cooperation of working together with the Word of God as God speaks to us requires us as men of God sometimes to step down step up stand up take responsibility and accountability and look at the surface problems detail yes easy to understand no is it good food for counselors yes if you replay sometimes some of these videos you'll go back and you'll look at it and you say wait a minute some of that made sense you know let me let me replay that and let me look at that again surface problems dealing in the area of sensual response by way of the five senses that were given or more by way of the senses that were given that trigger an automatic response in the soul by way of our feelings with which they affect our spiritual life which is the predicate and the premise of all of our relationships so that there's always something going on in conflict whenever we have a surface problem it's going to affect our relationships because it is involving our feelings and it involved through coming to our senses so if you want to put your senses in proper respect come to your senses so to speak and deal with the surface problem but we know now according to the book the surface problem isn't the only thing that's going on is it it's just a way of letting us know that there is an issue resulting illnesses wrong priorities financial problems lying stealing cheating arguments these are the visible results of inward conflicts these are some of the surface issues really that let us know that there's a inner problem think about that for a minute illness whoa how can an illness when we are out of balance in this area how can illness be a result of all this going on well that's pretty easy everybody knows stress and when you fret and worry and anxious as we know those are feelings and they're out of kilter with what the surface problem is which is who knows then the reality is it can cause illness so sometimes when we look at somebody that's sick people tell me hey pray for healing I say let me talk to the person no no no, no. I can tell you what's wrong with them and I say no you can't I can but you can't the reason I can is because I ask God I look the person in the eye. Person says, and it's happened to me. Person says to me, Michael, and I had this happen in Klamath Falls, Oregon, of all places, at Klamath Christian Fellowship. And I think <laughs> at the time I was, whatever I was, maybe in semi-elder, semi-deacon, I don't know, but whatever it was, we were just getting the church off the ground. No, I think there were elders over me, but anyways, I was involved in prayer. So they came to me for prayer woman comes up and says Michael I need prayer and I said okay what's the problem and so she told me and the Lord spoke to me at that time and says you can't pray that and I said well I'm sorry I can't pray for that and she said well what do you mean I said well 
that doesn't sound like a problem. That sounds like an issue that you're having with God that you need to talk to Him about. And I said, I can pray with you for God to show you what He wants you to know. But I said, I really can't pray for that because it sounds to me like when God is talking to me while you were speaking that there's something more going on. And she said, fine, and walked out the door. She came back a week later and said, thank you. She said, it was true. I was dealing with something, and I never expected anyone to say no, they couldn't pray about it. I was shocked, because I was in my learning stage, and I was kind of blessed, because I'm like, cool, Lord. And I was kind of like, uh-oh, this really confuses prayer. Because when we pray according to the will of God, God answers prayer. God always answers prayer one way or another. But a lot of pastors will use and abuse the privilege of Scripture by saying, well, if you didn't get an answer to your prayer, that's your fault. You were in sin. Or, well, you know, God's will, you know, you never know quite what His ways are. They're beyond our understanding and His thoughts aren't our thoughts. So, you know, you really can't get it. Did God tell you to pray in the first place? You see, that's the problem. When a person is ill or sick and they come to me for prayer, I ask them, hey, how are you doing? Who are you? Talk to me. Give me some input here. Let's fellowship together. Let's get to know one another so I understand what I'm praying for and if my prayers will be heard and if, in fact, God is going to respond in a positive way, in a way that you and I both expect Him to do, which is to heal, which is to hear, which is to comfort, and which is to console. So in all those areas, I ask God, what do you want me to pray for? Not, what does the person want me to pray? I learned that from Calvary Chapel Costa Mesa in intercessory prayer when we used to, in the men's prayer watch, get these little prayer requests that were like, you know, like two sentences. Joe, salvation. Fred, deliverance. Uh, Mabel, job. And we would pray over them. We men. Only, we would pray as the Spirit led. And however the Spirit led us, that's what we prayed. <laughs> and believe me, spooky times. God would tell us <laughs> what to pray. Oh, okay. Wow. And believe it or not, it was amazing. I don't know I don't know that I ever saw a direct correlation between answered prayer and the prayer at the time, but I know that God spoke to me at the time, so it's like it was cool. <laughs> I loved it. But anyways, having learned that from the Lord, that's why knowing the problem means that you have to identify yourself with the person. Jesus identified himself with our sin. He became sin for us that he could remove sin from our life. When a person comes to you and wants healing, I want to know more about what's going on in their life than just simply, hey, I want healing. I'm glad you want it, but what does God want for you? And that's the point. That's why you don't deal with just the surface problems. You need to get to the heart of the matter. Wrong priorities. Often people will pray, hey, you know, I just want prayer for a job. Well, good. I'll, I'll pray for your job now. Do you know Jesus? No. Do you want to know Jesus? No. Do you think it's kind of stupid to pray without knowing Jesus? No. Do you think your prayers are going to be answered without knowing Jesus? In other words, get the priorities right. Come on. Someone comes up to you and wants prayer for something, you got to understand what they're asking. And that's, again, surface issues. They may have a bigger problem than what's being asked of you or what really is going on. They may have wrong priorities. Somebody asking me to be healed of a hangover is a wrong priority. They need to be healed of drinking than of a hangover. Do you kind of get it? Wrong priorities. Those are all surface issues. Those are just symptoms of a bigger problem, an inner problem. Financial problems. Well, you know, yes, I'm a gambler, but you know, I need prayer for, for, for my finances. I need help on my finances. I need someone to help me to find more money so that I can go ahead and go gamble more. I think that's kind of like a wrong priority and a financial problem, you know, is that they just don't seem to have the right financial balance here. You know, 
God said he'd take care of all our needs. Now the financial problem is, are we paying our debts? You know, Well, I just want another credit card. I got two cars, but I really need to get out of debt. Okay, sell one of your cars. Well, no, 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 you don't get it. I got to have two cars. No, you know, no, no, I know the payment is, is high. It's true, you know. Or, well, you know, yeah, my house is, you know, underwater. It's, it's more expensive than I can afford. But, you know, I got to have a house. Don't I? Financial problems. They indicate an internal problem. Something's not right inside. Or something's not right deeper than just the surface problem. Lying. Usually, lying, in my personal opinion, just boils down to not recognizing God. God sees all, knows all, and quite frankly, you know, hears all. And so, lying really is kind of a waste of time, but some people think they get away with it. So, lying really does involve a whole host of problems that it's just an indicator of a surface problem. Cheating. <laughs> Cheating usually has more to it than just cheating, you know, because people that cheat usually are doing all kinds of other things with it. Cheating involves some lying, it involves some stealing, it involves some other things, you know, with pride and ego and all kinds of things. But it is still a surface problem that you got to look at from the point of view of it's not the real problem. So you can't just say, don't cheat, don't steal, don't lie. There's more going on. Arguing. Ooh! Ouch! Oh! Guilty! Crucify me now, Lord! <laughs> Argumentation is the proper discussion of logic. Arguing is emotional dissertation with no resolution and usually no cooperation. So, there's a difference between arguing and argumentation. Often, when I try to explain that, people don't get it. Because I can argue a point, because I have nothing against the person, and I can state a argumentation for the realization of some dissertation that's going on, whether through posting or privilege or, or premise or logic or fallacy or some type of informational uh, connectivity responses. But Unfortunately, a lot of people argue just to argue. Now, the only way... <laughs> ah! The only way that I know the difference between arguing and argumentation is I used to argue. <laughs> Somebody's going to go out there and go, He still does! He still does! <laughs> no, I don't. <laughs> I present argumentation. But the point is, is that, and I'm probably blushing, when I was a child, yes, all my life as a young person, I argued like crazy. I'd argue about everything. I could argue about anything, you know, and nine times out of ten, I was right. But it's that one-tenth of the time that I was wrong that people never caught me when I was wrong. Sadly, because had they, I probably would have argued less. But they, I was never wrong. I had a certain amount of facts that I would draw a conclusion from and a conclusion to be right. So I would argue about it. And sure enough, other people just didn't have a clue about what arguing was. And so I'd argue about it, they'd get mad, and they'd beat me up. <laughs> but that was before I was saved. Once I got saved, it took me about five years, maybe a little longer, to get over or arguing and discover there's a positive side called argumentation and logic and um, presentation. And so, in presentation of argumentation for the sake of resolution of information, then you come to a conclusion of the truth and a fact. But when you deal with emotional responses, you're notoriously going to run into surface issues that always come back to a soulful response that begins to create arguing as opposed to argumentation. So, the visible results of inward conflicts are always obvious in some way, whether they be through resulting illnesses or wrong priorities, financial problems, lying, stealing, cheating, or arguing. The scripture is from James 4.1. It says, From whence come wars and fightings among you? How do wars... How in the world could this have happened to you? How does this happen between you and anyone else? How is this happening, James says. 
don't they come from your lusts that war in your members? Don't they really come from you? Your lusts, lust of the eye, lust of the flesh, pride of life, your lusts, emotional, sensual, spiritual, physical, your lusts. James identifies and says, look, your wars, your fightings, they're not God. God didn't give them to you. God didn't tell you to have them. God said, in me, you will have peace. In the world, you will have tribulation, not wars. Tribulation, big difference. In the world, you shall have tribulation. But be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Jesus said, come unto me, all ye that are laden, I will give you rest. Jesus said, I am the Prince of Peace. In me, you shall have peace. When you're not in Jesus, it is obvious. You have a surface problem that has affected your relationship in God. When you don't have love for the brethren, it is a spiritual relationship that is in conflict with what God has said you should have. And you are dealing with feelings that somehow some type of sensory input has caused you to sacrifice your spiritual relationship with God. When you don't have joy, and joy is a very easy one to get, by the way. The joy of the Lord really happens through worship and just really God's presence being in any place, anytime, anywhere, and you've got joy because where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's joy. Well, that, quite frankly, is really a sensual response because even joy, as you'll find later in the fruits of the Spirit as we discuss in peace, love, and joy, there can be surface issues when we get into issues as opposed to problems. There can be surface issues in regards to the fruit of the Spirit that the misappropriation of them causes a lot of people to react in a surface problem through their senses as opposed to through their relationship that should have been directed by the Spirit of God. Flip this over and you have the proper response. Keep it as it is then you're always going to be dealing with the surface problem first because that's the thing that you see through your senses. Flip it over and you have the beginning of wisdom in every area of dealing with surface problems, and that is spiritual. Spiritual and relationship, or all spiritual relationships, or all relationships, should be the first, foremost, and the highest priority in dealing with any problem, conflict, or circumstance in your life, because that's what conflicts are. They are a problem in the relationship. And that could be a relationship anywhere. Relationship to your health a relationship to your wealth, a relationship to your finances, a relationship to your wife, your spouse, your neighbor, your relative, your dog, your cat, the air you breathe, the, the lungs you're taking in, the diet you have, the, quite frankly, mental outlook that you take every day. It is all spiritual relationships. And you'll find as we continue on in this principles of life, dealing with them, that now that we've identified that surface problems come through these three areas, uh, now that we've identified, let's be clear, <laughs> whoops, God says, uh-uh, not. Now that we've identified that surface problems migrate from responses that our senses have initiated sensually to us that affect our soul and our feelings and our spirit and our relationships, that we need to address those in a proper way, looking at them and identifying what the surface issues are so that when you do see those things we just talked about, the anger, the wrath, the malice, the whatever it is, recognize that it's always, these are mixed up in the surface problem. There is a spiritual relationship at risk. There is a feelings involved. There are senses that have been provoked in some way of something they saw, something they heard, something they felt, something they touched, something they smelt. It comes from right here, these surface problems affecting and reacting all of these to become involved in what the surface problem is. So Father, I thank you that you've given us at least a way to understand more how serious the surface problems really are and how we can't just go by what we see. 
We can't go by just what we hear. We can't go by what we just taste or what we touch. That God, those things can be confused and abused. God, those things are principles in life that although we have them, we can't let them affect us or infect our soul and our spirit to the point of causing us to have a problem deep inward and inside of us. We have to recognize that when those things are happening, we have a surface problem. But there's really an inner truth that needs to be addressed. There's something else going on inside that only you can see. And God, I'm glad that you bring to the surface these issues and these problems so that we can deal with them. So that we can admit that yes, our emotions are involved. Yes, it is affecting our spiritual relationships. Yes, it affects every relationship we have in life. So we need to identify, God, I have a problem. God, I am the problem. God, in me, there exists the problem you and I need to deal with. Help us, O oh Lord, to know those surface issues, know that it is on the surface and not necessarily the real problem or the whole story. But help us, O oh God, to stop what we're doing when we have a surface problem, to recognize it that we need to look a little closer. We need to pay attention and dig a little deeper. We need to understand with a little more of your spirit what's going on inside us that has caused this issue to come to the surface. And now it's a problem for us. Because, Father, until we do, we know we are affected and infected with sin in our life. And until we resolve that, God, we have a problem, and the problem is me. Amen. May it be that you consider, in this principle of life, dealing with the three aspects of surface problems, that there's more to the eye than meets the eye. There's more to hearing than what you hear. There's more to touch than what you can put your hands on or handle. There's more to smelling than what you can sniff out on your own. There's more than what you taste than what you think you thought you were putting in your mouth. Because the reality is God is doing something when he reveals the very principle of life and fact of life that there is a problem. And the problem now has come to the surface.